Hello everybody and welcome to this second A-level chemistry video about equilibria. And in this video we'll be focusing on the equilibrium constant Kc. We'll begin by looking at what it actually is, then we'll try some sample calculations and I'll do you a walkthrough of how you ought to approach these calculations. Then we'll focus on the units of the equilibrium constant and how you can work them out. And we'll finish by looking at the different conditions for equilibrium and their impact on the value of Kc. In our first video about equilibria, we explored what a dynamic equilibrium was and looked at Le Chatelier's principle about how equilibria can be affected by conditions. We also stated that just because something is in equilibrium, it doesn't mean that it is 50% reactant and 50% product. The proportions of reactants and products can vary dramatically from one equilibrium to the next and even from one temperature to the next. And so the equilibrium constant, Kc, is a numerical value that indicates the proportion of the products compared to the reactants. And a high value of Kc, significantly greater than 1, means that the products are predominating and the equilibrium lies heavily to the right-hand side, whereas a value of 1 suggests that the equilibrium is a 50-50 relationship, a value of less than 1 suggests that the reactants are predominating and that the equilibrium lies to the left-hand side. So the equilibrium constant Kc is a numerical value that gives you an indication of where the position of the equilibrium is. And this value will only be true for a particular temperature. Kc will vary with temperature. In order to calculate a value for Kc, we need to first be able to construct what's called the Kc expression. And the Kc expression is derived directly from the chemical equation for a particular reaction. So, if we take a look at this chemical equation here, where we can see that chemical A is reacting with chemical B, those are our reactants, and chemical C and D are our products. So to construct the Kc expression, we always write Kc equals, and then we write the products on top of a fraction, and then underneath the line, we write the reactants A and B. Now, Kc is the equilibrium constant that uses concentration values, and that little c is a reminder that it is using concentrations. And so we mentioned in the previous video that the shorthand way of writing concentration of chemical C is by putting square brackets around chemical C. And similarly, concentration of chemical D, concentration of chemical A, and concentration of chemical B. And so this is the first part of the Kc expression completed, the product concentrations on the top and the reactant concentrations on the bottom. Now, things can get slightly complicated if we have coefficients in the equation. So in other words, we might have what you might call a multiplier. We might have a certain number of molecules, moles, of chemical A. And so the number of times that they appear in the chemical expression, chemical equation, we need to raise it to the power of that in the Kc expression. So if we have A that appears x number of times, we raise it to the power of x. If b appears y times, we raise that to the power of y. And if c appears z times, then we raise c to the power of z. And then if d appears w times, we raise that to the power of w. And that's because for every time something appears in the chemical equation, it appears in the Kc expression. So we could write, if we had a more specific value, 2a plus b turns into 3c plus 4d, the Kc expression would be products on the top, so concentration of c times c times c. That's what I mean by for every time something appears in the chemical equation, it appears that many times in the Kc expression. And in the same way, we do that for the products as the reactants on the bottom. And so rather than writing it all this number of times, which is very cumbersome, we just write concentration of C cubed, concentration of D to the power 4, 
divided by concentration of A squared and concentration of B to the power of 1 because there were no digits in there. So the KC expression is derived straight from the chemical equation. The number of times something appears, that's the power that a particular chemical's concentration is raised to. And the products are on the top, the reactants are on the bottom. Let's take a look at an example now and we'll use the examples that we used in the first equilibria video just so we can get familiar with the equations that we need to remember. And I'll also remind you that all of the chemicals are in the same state here and that is referred to as a homogeneous equilibrium because all of the chemicals are in the same state or the same phase. So the Kc expression is the product concentrations on the top and we only have one product and then you don't have any multiplier in here, so that's a 1, so it only appears once. And remember the square brackets. We don't have to include the state symbols in KC expressions, and neither do you have to include what you sometimes see in textbooks, which is a little subscript EQM written after something's concentration. That's not necessary unless the exam question specifically asks you for it. And then the concentration of the reactants goes on the bottom. We've got two reactants. The carbon monoxide is raised to the power of one because it only appears once in the chemical equation and hydrogen appears twice. So we have got the hydrogen concentration squared. So that first equation was for the synthesis of methanol from carbon monoxide and hydrogen. The second one is for the synthesis of ethanol from ethene and steam. The KC expression, is the product concentration and we only have one product, the ethanol this time and so that goes inside square brackets for this concentration and this time we have got two reactants again but no powers in this equation at all because all of the coefficients are one and therefore not shown either in the chemical equation or as powers in the KC expression. And the last example that we used in the first equilibria video was ammonia synthesis and so the Kc expression here would be the concentration of ammonia at equilibrium squared because it appears twice in the chemical equation. And then we'd be dividing that by the reactant concentration, which involves putting nitrogen into the equation once and hydrogen goes into the expression three times. So we raise it to the power of three. Do note, I haven't said this before, I've sort of implied it, that this is a multiple here. It is not an addition. So you don't have to write the multiple, and people generally don't, but it is the nitrogen concentration multiplied by the hydrogen concentration. They're definitely not added together. Now, to actually calculate a value for Kc, you need to know the equilibrium concentrations of the chemicals involved, because Kc is the equilibrium constant using the concentrations of the chemicals at equilibrium. And so if they give you a question such as the one that's here, which is just simply what is Kc, or probably they would say what is the value of Kc, it's nice and easy. You have to construct an expression, and normally this will be a multi-mark answer, and so you will probably get one mark for actually constructing the expression. So I strongly advise you to do that rather than just leaping straight in and plugging the numbers in. So now we've got our KC expression, remembering square brackets. We are literally plugging in the values that we've been given in the equation up here. 0 0.3 is the concentration of hydrogen iodide, and we need to square it because it is squared in the KC expression, and hydrogen is 0 0.4, and iodine is 0 0.5. And then we calculate our value for Kc, and we are nearly done. We need to now start thinking about units. The units of Kc can be something that people find tricky. So let's lay out a few examples here, so hopefully you'll be able to work them out for yourself in future. The units of Kc depend on the moles of product and the moles of reactants because the Kc expression is the concentrations of products divided by the concentration of reactants. So it would follow that that would be what the units depend upon. If we return to the equation from the previous page and the Kc expression that we just worked out, we can add the units to the Kc expression calculation and then since the units are moles per decimeter cubed for all the different concentrations, 
Once we've written all those moles per decimeter cube values in, we can start to cancel them out. Because moles per decimeter cube divided by moles per decimeter cube cancels out and kind of leaves a 1, which again we don't put in. And then the other moles per decimeter cube cancels by moles per decimeter cubed. So mathematically we're left with a 1. And because we're talking about units, what that really means is that there are no units for this Kc value. And the reason that there are no units for this Kc value is that there were two terms on the right hand side for the moles of the products. And there are two terms on the left hand side for the moles of reactants. So where the number of moles on the left hand side of the equation and the moles on the right hand side of the equation are equal, there will be no units for the Kc expression. And so let me be absolutely clear, what I mean by that is the coefficients or the multipliers, they add up to the same value on the left hand side as the right hand side. So here are three examples of equations that wouldn't have any units. If we take a look now at a few other examples of where the units of Kc are not going to cancel each other out, and so there are going to be units, if we have a look here, the Kc for this expression is going to be d squared c divided by ab. And then the units of Kc will be derived from the algebra. We've got moles per decimeter cubed for c, moles per decimeter cubed multiplied by moles per decimeter cubed for d and then moles per decimeter cubed multiplied by moles per decimeter cubed on the bottom and so they will cancel each other out and we'll left, be left with moles per decimeter cubed on the top and so the units of Kc for the first one are moles per decimeter cubed. If we have a look at the second one, Kc is y concentration, z concentration, divided by x concentration, and again, moles per decimeter cubed, multiplied by moles per decimeter cubed on the top, and then moles per decimeter cubed on the bottom, cancelling out one moles per decimeter cubed from the top and one from the bottom, and so once again, the units of Kc are moles per decimeter cubed. And then on the third one, we have got a situation here where we've got lots and lots of different terms to write in. So I'm going to suggest a shorthand. Instead of writing moles per decimeter cubed every time, write the letter C only at first. And that little C is just your abbreviation for moles per decimeter cubed. And so Kc is R cubed S squared P q squared. And so we've got c times c times c for r, because it's r cubed, and then we've got c times by c for s, and then we've got c once for p, and we've got c twice for q. And then when we cancel, we cancel three c's off the top for the three c's off the bottom. And so now we write in moles per decimeter cubed multiplied by moles per decimeter cubed on the top. And one of the rules of powers is when you multiply one power by another, moles to the 1 times by moles to the 1 is moles squared. That's easy enough from algebra. Now, when it's, mole, um, when it's dm minus 3 multiplied by dm minus 3, you add those powers together as well. So moles squared dm minus 6 is the answer to this one. And notice that the first two that we looked at had the same units, moles per decimeter cubed. And that was because there was two terms on the right, one term on the left, three terms on the right, two terms on the left. So the number of terms on the right hand side was one greater than it was on the left. And when that is the case, the units will always be moles per decimeter cubed. And then in the third one, there was five terms on the right hand side and three terms on the left. But crucially, the right hand side was two greater than the left hand side. And so for any situation like that, it will always be mole squared dm minus 6. So that will get familiar and predictable for you. Well, we had a look at some situations where the units of Kc were 0 because we had the same moles on both sides. And we looked at some on the previous page where there was more products than there were reactants. Now we've got a situation where in each of these three scenarios, there are more reactant moles than there are products. So if we just work out Kc for each of these, 
and here we have all three of the KC expressions. We'll do the units of the first one sort of like properly, so to speak, and really clearly. So we've got moles per decimeter cubed on the top once, moles per decimeter cubed on the bottom twice because it's the concentration of A squared. And so when we do our cancellations, the one from the top disappears and one of the two from the bottom disappears. So we're left with one over moles per decimeter cubed. And whenever you've got something on the bottom that's got powers and you want to bring it up to the numerator on the top, you invert the sign. And so what that means is moles to the one becomes moles to the minus one and dm to the th minus three becomes dm to the three. So the units of the first one have got mole minus one dm three. And that's going to be the case whenever you've got more reactant moles than product moles, you're always going to have a negative sign for the power for the moles and a positive sign for the dm cubed. So for this second one, because we've got so many terms, I'm just going to write C for concentrations units. So we've got one from the E and then we've got two from the F squared, three from the concentration of C cubed and two from the concentration of D squared. So we've got three on the top and five on the bottom. So we cancel all three of the ones on the top with three of the concentration terms on the bottom. And so we're left with two terms on the bottom and none on the top. So we've got moles per decimeter cubed twice on the bottom. And so when those two terms are kind of combined into one, moles to the power one becomes moles squared and dm minus three times dm minus three is dm to the minus six. And then once again, when we're bringing those terms up onto the top, moles to the two becomes moles to the minus two and dm to the minus six becomes dm to the six. And so those are our units here. Once again, negative moles. And last of all, one concentration term for F, one concentration term for G and four concentration terms for E. Cancel those terms out as far as we can. Two from the top, two from the bottom leaves us with one over concentration squared, which is once again, we've got two terms left over on the bottom, uh, just like we had up here. And so the units without following this line of logic through, the units will be exactly the same as the previous one, mole minus two, dm to the six. So it doesn't matter precisely how many terms you've got where, what matters is we've got two fewer terms in the products than we had in the reactants, four and two. That gives us the same units as five and three does. Moles minus two dm to the six. In order to calculate your value for Kc, you need to know the equilibrium concentrations of each of your reactants and products. In order to find the equilibrium concentrations, you will often be required to calculate the equilibrium moles of all of the reactants and products. And that's what we're going to take a look at here. In order to do this, you need to know two things. You need to know the moles of all of the chemicals that you had at the start, and you need to know the moles of one of the chemicals at equilibrium. And from those two bits of information, you can work out the moles of all the other chemicals present at equilibrium. So let's take a look at an example here. Suppose an exam question had said that chemical A and chemical B are mixed together and left to reach equilibrium. We start with 10 moles of chemical A and 8 moles of chemical B. And maybe they don't say this, but what's implied is that there is zero moles of chemical C and zero moles of chemical D. If they don't say anything, that's because there isn't any of them at the start. And that's really common for either side. One of, one of the two sides could be zero at the beginning. And then they would need to give you some extra information and say that at equilibrium, there were six moles of chemical A. And from being given just that one piece of data, you can work out what the value for equilibrium moles is for all of the others. And so the key bit of information is how much has this particular chemical changed by? And I usually refer to that as the X value. And so by going from 10 down to 6, A has changed by 4. It's gone down by 4. And so for me, X is 4. And one side of the equation will always go down. And it's the left hand side whose values are going to get smaller. And the values on the other side will always get bigger because from either side of the equation, you've got one considered to be the reactants, which will go down and one considered to be the products, which will go up. 
Now, if A is going down by 4, and the relationship between A and B is 1 to 1, that means that B will also go down by 4. So B will drop from 8 by 4 down to 4, in fact. Now, chemical C and chemical D also both have 1s in, and so their numbers will go up by the exact same amount that chemical A and chemical B went down by. They're going to go up by this x value, which is 4. And so they're both going up by 4, and so chemical C and chemical D will also now both equal 4. So that's the equilibrium moles in one example. Let's take a look at a second example here. We've got PCl5 turning into PCl3 and Cl2 at equilibrium, and the total volume is 2 decimeters cubed. And that's going to be important because this time we're actually going to calculate a value for Kc, including units. And so for our start moles, we've got 6 moles of PCl5, and it's going down to 4 moles at equilibrium. So that is a change, an x, of 2. And this is the side that's going down, so it's gone down by 2 on here. So x equals 2. And so if the PCl5 has gone down by 2, the PCl3 is going to go up by 2. I've not told you any different, so we can deduce that there is 0 of both of our products, so they both go up by 2 from 0 to 2. And so the Kc expression has got the equilibrium concentrations of PCl3 multiplied by equilibrium concentration of chlorine divided by the equilibrium concentration of PCl5. Now we don't have the equilibrium concentration we have just calculated the equilibrium moles. And so what we need to do next is calculate the equilibrium concentrations of all three of these numbers. And so concentration is moles divided by volume. And so we've just calculated what the equilibrium moles are, 4 for PCl5, divided by the volume, which was 2. So the equilibrium concentration of PCl5 is 2, and so we can put that on the bottom of our relationship here. The equilibrium concentration of PCl3 is moles, 2, divided by volume, 2, which is 1, and it's the same for chlorine's equilibrium concentration as well. And so that is 1 multiplied by 1 divided by 2, which of course is 1 divided by 2, which is 0 0.5. And because there are two concentration terms on the top and one on the bottom, in other words, one more term on the top than the bottom, the units will be moles per decimeter cubed. Let's take a look at another example here where we're going to calculate Kc for this equilibrium. So I've given you all the starting moles information here, 10 of chemical X, 14 of chemical Y and 0 of chemical Z. And this time I've given you the equilibrium moles of one of the products just to show you that it works in the same principle. Because once again, we've got one side of the equation that has obviously gone up in moles. So this is the product side and the other side is going to go down. So this side is going up, the other side is going to go down. How much has it gone up by? What is our X? It's gone up by three. So that means that X equals three. And so Z has gone up by three, and because the ratio, this time I'm going to pay more attention to the ratio because it's not one to one throughout, but the X to Z ratio is one to one. So if Z went up by three, X is going to go down by three. So it's going to go down from 10 to seven. And here we've got our first significant difference. Y, because the coefficient in the equation for Y is two, that means that we need to use two moles of y for every one mole of z. So it's going to go down by our x, but it's going to go down by x times by 2 because of the numbers in the equation. So 3 times 2 is 6, so it's going to go down to 8. Now we've got our equilibrium moles. Let's imagine once again that they've told us that our volume is 2, just because I like to be able to do the maths in my head. So the volume is 2 decimeters cubed, so we need to know what the equilibrium concentrations are. So the moles was 7, so 7 over 2 is 3.5. And then for chemical Y, the moles was 8, volume is 2, so the concentration is 4. And for Z, the moles was 3, volume is 2, so the concentration is 1.5. Then we need to write our Kc expression. Kc is Z over X 
and then y squared. Plug those numbers in. Z concentration is 1.5, x is 3.5, and y is 4 squared. And so we get our answer for Kc. And the units of Kc, because we have got three concentrations on the left-hand side in the reactants and one in the products, we know, because we've already done two of them, that that's going to have two concentration terms left over on the bottom. So it's going to be moles minus two, dm6. And that's what I mean about you starting to get fast at remembering the units even. We'll do one last worked example here for how you calculate Kc. And I've deliberately once again gone for something where we don't just have coefficients of one. So we've got the Harbour process equation, ammonia being produced from nitrogen and hydrogen. The 12 moles of nitrogen at the start has gone down to 9, so this is the reactant side again, and it's gone down by 3, so our x equals 3. Because the nitrogen to hydrogen ratio is 1 to 3, that means that the hydrogen will also go down by 3, but this time it will be 3 multiplied by 3. So x is 3, but the coefficient for hydrogen is 3. So it's going down by 9, so it's going to go down to 6 moles of hydrogen at equilibrium. And the right-hand side is the product, so this is going to go up. It's going to go up by x, so up by x being 3. But because the coefficient for ammonia is 2, that means it's going to go up by 3 multiplied by 2, so it's going to go up by 6 to 6 for ammonia. And then if we look at the equilibrium concentration, this structure, by the way, you can see that I'm using the same structure every single time, and it won't steer you wrong. The equilibrium concentration for nitrogen is moles divided by volume. Moles is 9, volume is 3, so the concentration of nitrogen at equilibrium is 3. For hydrogen, it's 6 divided by 3, which is 2. And for ammonia, it's also 6 divided by 3, which is 2. So Kc is ammonia squared, nitrogen to the 1, and hydrogen, whoops, hydrogen to the 3. And so that leaves us with 2 squared divided by 3 times by 2 cubed which gives us our answer for Kc. And actually this was an accident, but once again, we've got four chemicals on the reactant side and two on the product side. And so because we've got left over two concentration terms on the bottom, that means that once again, for the fourth time, there's going to be moles squared on the bottom. So it's gonna become moles minus two when we bring it up to the top, dm minus six on the bottom. So it's gonna become dm six when we bring it up to the top. So this is our value for Kc with its units. We're going to take a look now at the factors that affect the value of Kc. And in fact, I should really call it the factor that affects Kc, because quite simply, it is only temperature that affects the value for Kc. And it does this because it can make the equilibrium shift in whichever direction, depending on whether it's an exothermic or endothermic and a high temperature or a low temperature. Do check out my Equilibria 1 video if you want to have a recap of Le Chatelier. So temperature is the only thing that affects the value of Kc because it is the only thing that shifts the position of equilibrium and doesn't do anything else. Now, catalysts don't affect the value for Kc, and that's because they don't affect the position of equilibrium, and so they just affect how quickly equilibrium is reached. So it's very logical that catalysts wouldn't affect the value for Kc. Where we get a slight bit of confusion is why doesn't pressure, or more obviously even concentration, why doesn't that affect the value for Kc? And the reason for this is that even though increasing the concentration of the reactants, say, would make the equilibrium shift to the right-hand side to produce more products, the Kc expression compensates for that because we increase the amount of reactants in the first place. And so that means that we would expect Kc to go down because we've got more reactants, more stuff on the bottom of the Kc expression. But the shifting of the equilibrium is such that those additional reactant moles that were added 
are converted into products in such a way to restore that original ratio. And so the shifting of the equilibrium right suggests that Kc should go up. The increase in the amount of reactants suggests that Kc should go down. And those two changes exactly cancel each other out and so the reactant and product concentrations remain in the same proportion even if their amounts have changed. One final caution to do with Kc effects is to be clear that something can affect the position of equilibrium without affecting Kc and I want to pick something that's a little bit obscure just to make that clear. So for instance what if the pressure was changed in a subtle way by the volume of a container that contains an equilibrium mixture of gases, what if that volume is decreased? What effect will that have on the position of equilibrium and the value of Kc? Well, the first thing is that the volume decrease means that we've got the same number of molecules of gas in a smaller volume. In other words, we've got a higher pressure. And so because we've now got a higher pressure, Decreasing the volume has had the effect of raising the pressure, which means that the equilibrium will shift to the side with the fewer molecules of gas, which is the right-hand side. So the equilibrium shifts to the right-hand side. That's sort of like not up for negotiation. What will happen to the value of Kc? Well, nothing is the short answer, and the reason is exactly the, as on the previous page, that even though the equilibrium is shifting right, which is making more products, which makes us think that the Kc value should go up, the fact that we decrease the volume means that the concentrations increased, and the concentrations increase will be more significant on the left hand side because there are four terms in the reactants so in the Kc expression we've got moles divided by volume we've got volume four times in that Kc expression on the bottom but only twice on the top so an impact of changing the volume will have the greater impact on the reactants so the equilibrium shift says that Kc should go up increasing the concentration says that Kc should go down and so those effects cancel each other out precisely. I want to finish this video by taking a look at how you could use an experiment to determine the position of equilibrium and the value of Kc. And in fact, all of the calculations that we've done, you can't tell just by looking at a reaction mixture what the position of equilibrium is. Even if one of the chemicals is coloured, you can only have an indication of whether it lies to in the direction of the coloured brown gas or, or, or the blue chemical we have to do an experiment that gets some data before we can analyze the value of Kc. And so what I want to look at is an esterification reaction. And to do this, you would mix together some carboxylic acid of known density and volume, so you could work out the moles of them using the density equation. Density equals mass over volume, and so the mass is density multiplied by volume and once you know what mass of your two chemicals you've got you can then use the moles equals mass over MR relationship to take your mass divide it by the relative molecular mass and that is how many moles of your two chemicals you have got at the beginning and then in the esterification reaction what's going to happen is the carboxylic acid and the alcohol are going to turn into your ester and water in a one to one to one to one relationship and that is our starting situation. You probably will have some moles of water at the beginning because one of your reactants might well be water-based. So you would need to know the value at the start. And then here's the key bit, and this is why I'm sharing this in the video. After a certain amount of time, equilibrium will be reached. Maybe we'll leave it a week to be sure. Sometimes three or four days is long enough to reach equilibrium. But crucially, once we're sure equilibrium has been reached, we withdraw a sample of the reaction mixture and we use titration method using sodium hydroxide to work out how many moles of acid there are present in the equilibrium mixture. And we can make that deduction for how many moles of acid we've got left over to work out what our value of X is. Because the acid moles that we started with take away the acid moles at equilibrium, that is how we find our value for X. And once we found our value for X for the acid, because the ratio is 1 to 1 to 1 to 1, we can work out how many moles of all the other chemicals we will have at equilibrium as well.
There's one extra complication because esterification uses a concentrated acid catalyst. When we are doing the titration and we're working out how many moles of acid we've got in our equilibrium mixture, we will have to take away the moles of catalyst from what we assume is carboxylic acid that's left over because the catalyst doesn't get used up that's part of its definition. So however many moles of catalyst we put in at the beginning, that will still be there in the equilibrium mixture. So from our titration calculations, we remove the catalyst and that is the true value of the carboxylic acid at equilibrium moles. And it's that value that we use to work out our unknowns. From these equilibrium moles, it is really tempting to think, OK, right, what's the equilibrium volume? Let me divide all these moles by the volume to get the concentrations. But I want to finish this video with one actual bonus that will save you a lot of time. Because there are two concentration terms at the top of this KC expression, and there are two concentration terms on the bottom, and because concentration is calculated by doing moles divided by volume, when we plug that in to the KC expression, all of these volumes are equal. And what I mean by that is we've got two terms divided by volume on the top, two terms divided by volume on the bottom, and they will cancel each other out. And so when you've got the same number of moles on both sides of this equilibrium, you don't need to use equilibrium concentrations. Equilibrium moles is good enough because they will get you the exact same answer. I should also point out that on these occasions when your life gets made easier and you don't have to use the volume, the units will also cancel out for the exact same reasons. So KC in this situation, you can use the moles and it will have no units. Okay, that's the end of this video. Hope it was useful. Thanks for listening.